Head over to MiniatureMarket.com where they have thousands of board games at discounted prices and you can sign up for product alerts. Hello my friends, it's the Game Boy Geek here and today we're going back in time, way back to when Jack the Ripper escaped from London and made his way all the way to New York and is hiding out. Today we're taking a look at Mr. Jack in New York which is recently being reprinted uh, with new artwork, new board, new components and such. So I'm going to, since I've never reviewed this game before and it's an older game, I'm going to show it to you because it just made my top 10 games of all time. Let me show you how it's played. I'll see you on the other side. In Mr. Jack in New York, one of you is going to be Jack the Ripper, and you're secretly going to be one of these characters, and the other player is going to play the investigator trying to figure out who they are and be able to accuse them. But regardless of which side you are, each of you are going to be able to control these characters at different times throughout the game. Now whichever player is Jack is going to secretly shuffle up these cards, and they're going to look at one, and they're going to take one from the pile. This would be secret, so they would get to see that Jack is actually Alfred Beach. And this is the sort of dark brown character. Now, of course, this is secret the entire game. The rest of these will come into play later, but now we know who Jack is. Now, here is the game set up. It is set up exactly the same way every single time. And the game is played over eight different rounds. Now, each round is going to alternate. In the first round, the investigator is going to get the first move. Then Jack, who's silver, is going to get the next two moves in a row, leaving the investigator with the last move. And as you see, this alternates. In the second round, Jack gets the first move, investigator gets two in a row, then Jack gets the third. And this just keeps, uh, you know, repeating itself through the eight rounds. Now, what Jack is trying to do is either stay hidden until the end of the eighth round, where he has not been accused, if so, he wins, or Jack can win by escaping. Now, escaping, there's three different ways you can escape. Out this alleyway where the arrow is, they'll be able to, Jack will be able to escape. You can also escape off a boat, but at the beginning of the game, there's police blocking those boats as well. Plus, there's some specific things about light that will allow or not allow Jack to escape, which we'll go over in just a minute. So Jack's either trying to escape or last past the eighth round without being accused, and the investigator's trying to catch him before the eighth round and accuse them and be correct. Now there's eight characters, and those characters have cards, and they're all shuffled up, and four of them are randomly placed at the beginning of the round. And now here we see four random characters. Now after the first round, in the second round, the other four will come up. So you'll actually know, since there's only eight characters, once you see the four characters that are put out in this odd round, which is the first round, you'll know which ones are going to be coming up next round, and that gives to a lot of strategy in the game. So again, the investigator is going to go first. They get to select one of these characters, and they'll be able to move that character one to three, but each of these characters have a little different special ability. So let's talk about light. Right now, as the game starts, all of these three characters are known as what's able to be seen, or they're in the light. And that's because they're in hexes that are adjacent to each other. So all three of these characters can be seen because they're all seeing each other. Same with these three. They're next to each other, and they're in the light. This one has nothing around them, so they're in the dark. This one has nothing around them, so they're in the dark. Now I say that to say that's very important to what's going to happen at the end of each round. However, one of the characters that's in this round is uh, Lewis Howard Latimer. He helped create the filament and the light bulb. Now, he can move one to three. Now, when you move, you can move through characters. You just can't land on one unless you're the investigator and you're trying to actually accuse them. So this person could move three, let's just say over here. In this case, that was two. But they could actually move three, like one, two, three. Just like that. Now, their thing is they can, before, after they move, they can add a light. Now, why is light important? Well, we just talked about, well, they might want this character over here to be in the light. We know that this character did not come up this round, the purple one. So you know what? This player moved away, and he put this character in the light. And that's going to be important. Because at the end of the round, we're going to find out if Jack is able to be seen or not. Because let's say at the end of the round, it looked like this. We have this character that can't be seen, same with this one, same with this one, same with this one. We have these three that can be seen, and this one that can be seen. It's half and half. The investigator, the, the, the better off they are is if they can, you know, get characters split in half. But you don't want to do, do it too much because it makes it more sort of dangerous. Because right now it's half and half. If the, the round ended now and we said, 
Jack, can you be seen? If Jack said, no, I can't be seen because I'm not in the light, we would then flip over each of the characters that can be seen because Jack just told us that, nope, I can't be seen. So in the end of the first round, if this is how it looked, we would actually have it narrowed down half of the characters, which would have been huge. But again, as I'll show you later, it's a little, it's a little risky to, to, to put that many in the dark. So we know that Jack would be one of these four characters because we told him that he was in the dark. Now this is also super important because if Jack's in the dark, this flips over. And what that means is that next round, Jack can escape. Otherwise he couldn't. Even if Jack was right here and the Jack player knew who it was, they can't escape unless the round before he was in the dark. So let's talk a little bit more about the characters. Now we, we know secretly that this is Jack. Now that character can add a metro station before or after he moves. A metro station starts here and here and here and here at the beginning of the game. But we could do something like this where maybe they put a metro station right here and then he goes one, two, Three, maybe trying to get close to an, an exit. Of course, he's putting himself in the light, but that's sort of how the metro stations work. They allow you to move pretty fast. Callahan, he can move the roadblock. So he could take this and he could say, you know what, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna block that. So that opens up areas to be able to get to the boat, which Jack might be able to escape on, but he's just blocked the alley and you can't move through light. So this spot is completely moved. I could do a lot of sneaky things in this game. Like let's say we were Jack and we were in the dark and it was our turn to move. We could move this out of the way. One, two, we're on the boat, gone. We've just escaped. Or maybe he was on the metro station and he was in the dark. He could go one, two, three, and he's gone. So things can move pretty fast in this game. Now, regardless of if, if suspects or uh, characters are suspects or not, remember, if, if it's this side, they're no longer suspects. If it's in color, they might possibly be Jack. But these characters will still come up, and they still get to move, and they still get to use their abilities. You just know that this one's not Jack. Now, this one, Smith, can move the boats. So maybe they take the boat from here, and they move it over here where it's sort of blocked, right? But again, this player could be pretty sneaky, because if they're in the corner over here, uh, and this, this was up here and being blocked, and it's this player's turn, and they're Jack, and they're not seen. They can go, you know what? My first move, I'm going to move this, and I'm on the boat, and I'm gone. So a lot of little sneaky tactics you can do in this game. Now, Cloud Rider is really cool. Let's say that uh, she was possibly a suspect. Before, after she moves, she can add a building. Now, what this does, this adds one building to this huge building, but she is the only one that can move through buildings. So she can go one, two, three, and be gone if she was not seen the night before. Now Grant, what she gets to do is she gets to turn something into a park, which essentially is flipping over one of the tiles. This one was light, now it's a park. And why is that interesting? Well, maybe she moves into it now, and when you're in a park, regardless of what's next to you, whether lights or people, you can't be seen. So maybe she was moving herself in there to hopefully try to escape a little bit later. It puts a lot of pressure on the investigator. Now, Tumulty, they have a really cool thing. Before or after they move, they can swap someone who's adjacent with them. So maybe they moved one, and they're going to swap this player with this one. Oh, no, they just moved Red to a park. Red's going to be, you know, not seen at the end of this round unless they, someone, someone figures out a way to get her out of there. Uh, and she's really close to possibly escaping next round, so you can put a lot of pressure on. Purple's really powerful because they can move other characters. And Eastman is also very powerful because instead of moving, they can move someone else in the same light as them. Right now, they cannot be seen, so they could move anyone three spots that can't be seen. So let's say this player was was on the you know who's the Jack player's turn. Let's say this was actually the, the Jack for the game. They could activate this player. This one can't be seen. This one can't be seen. They could move her. Boom, gone. So there's a lot of sneaky things you could do as Jack. So again, each round, a certain player's getting the first move, then the other player's getting two, and then the, the last player's getting one, and then you're gonna see if Jack can be seen or not, and you're gonna be flipping over suspects to, to narrow it down to Jack. And as players are taking characters, they're sort of moving them off the board to say, hey, I've, I've used that character. And then in the next round, the other four are coming up. Again, showing that you can move one to three, and then showing what their special abilities are that I've already gone over. Now, at the end of an even round, these are going to get removed, and these will be shuffled with all the other characters again, so that on the next odd round, it's again a randomized four set that will come out. Now, there is another spot here, Liberty Island. If you go here, you can go one, two, and go right here. You get to take the informant. Now the informant, first of all, you get to place this somewhere, the X side down somewhere. This is kind of cool because you can actually put this in a spot to block someone so that they can't land here. Because you, you can go through it, but you couldn't end your movement here. 
Let's say I was afraid of someone getting close to this player. I could put it here, be like one, two. Well, they're not going to be able to get close to him. But even more importantly, the player that got him gets to draw from the Jack deck. This is the Alibi. Now, if it was the Investigator, it's always kept secret. The Investigator would know that Jack is not red. But Jack does not know that. So when you're playing, you could play to your strengths of, of, of knowing. Now, if the Jack player gets this, they get to look at it secretly. And now they know that the investigator doesn't know about this, you know? So there's a lot of information you can gain from that informant. Now, Liberty Island is not, there's, you can't be lit there. So let's say he was in the dark. Let's say another round or two go by. He comes up, he's in the dark. See these arrows, you can go to here. You can go to here. If he was in the dark, literally one, two, three, see you later. Jack just escaped off the boat. So in general, that's how the game's played. So in general, that's how the game's played. Again, if you get past the end of the eighth round and there's been no accusation, Jack will win. If Jack escapes, he wins. But if the investigator were to accuse somebody, if they're correct, they win. If they're wrong, they lose immediately. The game ends either way. That's pretty much the very general basics of Mr. Jack in New York, but there is a ton of depth and tactics I haven't even started talking about. This is just the very basics. Yeah, recently I just came out with my top 101 games of all time. This was in the top 10. In fact, this was my number two favorite game of all time, and I'd never reviewed it. I don't know why, probably because I bought the game many years ago and just I'm too busy doing all new reviews and such. So now I have a chance because this is being reprinted. So let's talk about why I think th this is my second favorite game of all time. Number one, it has deductive asymmetry, which is really cool because it is a sort of a deduction game. It's also more like an abstract game with special abilities, but there is some deductive aspects and trying to see who is who, uh, who is Jack, what are they doing? Why are they doing that? And you're deducing a lot of different things depending on what's going on. And the both sides feel very different from when you're trying to hide and how you're trying to set things up into how you're trying to narrow it down as the investigator. So I love it that you could basically play both, both sides of this game, uh, 30 minutes each in about an hour, uh, and play both sides if you want to. Or you could just play one side. But I love how it, it sort of feels different on both sides. This has a lot of similarities to one of my favorite genres, which is hidden movement, where, you know, games like Letters of Whitechapel and things like that. In this game, you're not really hidden movement. You kind of are, though, because in normal hidden movement, you're, you're, nothing's being moved on the board when you're moving, and you're moving behind like a shield with a note paper and stuff. Here, everything on the board is being moved. You just don't know which one Jack is. And that's so, so it is similar to hidden movement with a little bit of a twist. So if you like hidden movement games, this might be one that you'll like. This game has a perfect mix of strategy and luck. Uh, Bruno Cathal is my favorite game designer. He was a competitive chess player, and in a lot of his games, there's a lot of this abstract chessy style play where you're looking in a two player space and you're thinking one, two, three, four moves in advance. And this is very much like that where you're looking and you're trying to see all the possibilities there, but each round, four characters are coming out and that's random. You're never exactly sure which ones are gonna come out each odd round and then once that happens for the next four you always can deduce which other four characters there are but every two rounds it's randomized as to which characters are coming out and which ones come out together and with the state of the board really has a determination as to what can happen because you could have yourself set up really well and be like if this character does not come up this odd round i'm going to be able to escape next round if i play this right and then you see them come up and you're like, ah, okay, we'll have to wait a little bit longer. Let's try to pivot and make a little bit of a different strategy here. Uh, this game I found has layers and layers and layers of depth. Now, I've only found this over many, 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 many plays. You used to be able to play this game online. It's broken and it hasn't been able to be fixed, but you used to be able to play it online. And I've played this game over 250 times. That's in a combination of plays in person and plays online. I played it more than 50 times a person, but I played it a lot online as well. And through all that, I've learned that there's just so many layers to this onion of strategy in this game, where you've got bluffing, you've got double bluffing, you've got paying attention which characters they've taken, which ones they've not in certain instances, and why would they do that? Um, and you're, 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 which ones did they leave you throughout the game? And there's just so much to think about and so many tactics that you can ploy in this game that, even now, after 250 plays, I'm still seeing moves that happen that I go, 
oh man, I wish I would have thought of that. That's a really clever move, you know? And it's just, it's such, it's so great. And the reasons why this, I'll get to in just a moment, a little bit uh, in a moment, but there are a lot of different abilities, right? Each character, eight of them, they all have different abilities and they all work differently and they all act differently. And I think that's really cool. Um, you're looking at all the, all the permutations of actions. Cause I love the Mr. Jack system where the first player is going to take one action. The next player is going to take two in a row and they're leaving that first player with whatever's left. And you're trying to leave them with something that doesn't undo what you did. So the first turn of each round is always very hard because you're looking at what you might do and you're looking at every permutation of like, if I do this, they might do this and this and leave me with this. Then, and then, then if they do that, it's my first move with this really good. No, let's look at this one. And you're like looking through the layers of like what can happen and I love that. And like mathing that out and looking at it and thinking ahead is just such a great part of this game. I also like in this version of the game, Mr. Jack in New York, you are literally creating the board every game. You're placing metro stations, you're placing lamps, you're placing parks. And so there's some rules as to where you can place a place and not place, but every game you're basically creating the board as you play. So every game feels very different of this, not to mention as earlier, you know, with the randomized way the characters come out. So this game, I think, has absolute unbeatable un un and unlimited replayability. As I mentioned, I've played this over 250 times. Now, this game's unbelievable. It was my number two game of all time. But is it the best one for you? Maybe not at first. Let me go over why. I don't think this is the best Mr. Jack game to start with. It is the deepest, the hardest to grasp, the most going on, the most choices, which is almost overload at the beginning, especially with the board and such. The best Mr. Jack, if you're just starting out, is called Mr. Jack Pocket. That gives you a sense of what the system's like, how it works, the asymmetry of things, the abstract nature of it. You don't have any like super special actions in that, but it is very basic. You can literally fit this game in your pocket. You can play it on a plane. It's inexpensive. It's like 20 bucks or less. It is a great start to Mr. Jack. Then there's the other ones. There's the regular Mr. Jack. Then there's Phantom of the Opera, which is really hard to find. Um, this one is by far my favorite, Mr. Jack in New York, but it's probably not the best one to start with. Also, this and the original Mr. Jack probably won't wow you on your first play. And as weird as this sounds, even though it's my second favorite game of all time, I actually traded this game away after playing it two or three times, as, along with the original Mr. Jack. And I actually love both of these games. This is my second favorite game of all time. I've traded it away because in this day and age of board games, you play something and if you're not absolutely wowed, there's thousands of others that will wow you, that could possibly wow you on the first play. This, I don't think will do that. In my experience, it didn't do it to me and it hasn't done it to other players. Usually when you play a game of this, you'll go, oh, okay, that was cool, what's next, right? But if you stop there, you won't get to the depth of this game. So it probably won't wow you, but if you give it time and you give it the, you know, the, 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 the repeated plays, um, you will be rewarded with seeing things and having the things sort of just like unlock play after play after play and eventually, I believe this game will win you over if you like sort of abstracty two-player style games with special abilities with deduction. Now, the last negative thing here is it can be really hard to find opponents to play this with because you can't play it online anymore. Once you're good at this game, it's really hard to play against someone who's just new at the game and have it be anything but not enjoyable for you or for them because you'd crush them if you tried. If you don't try, it's not as fun. However, I have created sort of a beginner's guide to this game. Uh, you can find it on Board Game Geek under the file section. You can also find it on GameboyGeek.com if you just search for Mr. Jack in New York. And the guide is meant to, uh, once you've played the game once or twice and you understand how all the characters work, you can read this guide. It's split up into two sections, you playing as the investigator, you playing as Jack. And it gives you some ideas of some of the, just scratching the surface of some of the layers of depth and some of the tactics to, that, that really make this game sing. It's not a strategy guide. It's not to say you should play it this way. But if you read that guide, you could be competitive right after a few plays with someone who knows the game really well. You probably still won't win, but you can at least not get crushed. And so I've created a guide to help with this, but it is hard to find opponents because once you get really good, it's hard to, you could bring players along, but it will, in my experience, it takes usually about 10 plays to get someone like to the point where they're really competitive. But with my guide, you, they might be really competitive in three plays, which is, you know, not, not a whole lot. So overall, this game's not for everybody, but 
I hope that you'll figure out if this is for you. It is an unbelievable abyss of depth and strategy. Mr. Jack in New York, an unbelievable game. And for that, because I never did Saxo on Saturdays back in the day and I hadn't reviewed this yet, let's induct it properly to my gaming library with a saxophone serenade. Game Toppers not only transforms your existing table to a high quality gaming solution, they now offer full leg kits and dining cover solutions for the full table application. Paired with their amazing thematic premium stitch edge mats from noted board game artists like Vincent Dutre, collapsible cup holders, and really cool accessories, it's a complete system that upgrades every game you play. Go to GameToppersLLC.com or click the link below.